want to say, isn't this beautiful what they, what the, the, the team did to make this look great up here? Doesn't that look awesome? I just thought, just re, re-noticed it this week, so I thought it looked, I thought it looked excellent. Um, thank you for everyone who worked on that. Um, so we're in this series called A Thrill of Hope, and uh, last week we talked about hope um, kind of with this framework. We all um, probably hope for things in our lives. Um, but our hope for things hinges upon what we hope in. And so there's this dynamic between hoping in and then hoping for. And um, we, we kind of looked through Abraham a little bit, but we established a few definitions. And so I just want to start with this. This is the definition we used um, from Hebrews uh, 11.1. 1. Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. And so hopefully last week you came away with this idea of uh, there's this confident assurance that's all part of hope. And um, hopefully you were uh, struck with the question of where is yours? Uh, What do you hope in or who do you hope in? Um, And so as you think about that, um, you know, we have a lot of hopes for our lives. And probably some of you right now are, are hoping for certain things that you want to happen, maybe until Christmas morning. I, I want these things to happen in my life. Or, you know, I want to have this, uh, I want to have this meeting with my boss be- because, I, you know, I, I'm hoping for this promotion. Or I'm hoping that my, my kid uh, behaves this way. Or my parents do this for me. You have hope for things. But what we're constantly brought back to is... Um, That is, the way you hope for things is vitally influenced by where where you place your hope. What is your hope in? And those dynamics, right, uh, play themselves out in our lives all the time. Um, And so as we hope for things, right, we hope for things, the the struggle, the conflict is um, not demanding these things and, and kind of using our own strength. And wanting things now. Because God asks us to learn how uh, to wait. Um, His promise with his people started in Genesis 12. We're going to start here. um, with this is We we brought this up last week. Because Israel's hope started really with Abraham. Where he said, look Abraham, all the families on earth will be blessed through you. It's going to be a massive movement. If you just take Abraham, which was roughly... Uh, 2170, let's go. 2170 BC. That's, that's when Abraham lived. And you walk through the entire Old Testament. So 2170 BC, uh, Abraham, let's jump all the way to David, which is roughly 1000 BC, right? Israel, you're going to be um, a massive power. And so we, their time in, in uh, Egypt. And then they came and entered the promised land. They said, I want a king. Saul didn't work out. David did. It expanded. His son Solomon expanded the kingdom even more, and there was a lot of hope, right? Okay, God, you really are going to use Israel. You really are going to bless the world through the people of Israel. And then what happened? About 1000 AD, roughly 9, 950, 920 AD, or BC, it was a split, and things began to fracture. And in the Old Testament, they never recover. It gets worse and worse and worse and worse, and Babylon takes over the north, northern, or the Assyrians take over the northern kingdom, and the Babylonians and the Persians come, and they ultimately take southern Israel, and then you know the Persians beat the Babylonians, and the Greeks beat the Persians, and the Romans beat the Greeks, and then you're like, all right, what's going to happen? I mean, we're hoping, right? We're hoping in, in the promises, God. Are you? Um, Are you really going to come through? The last book in the Old Testament, 450 B.C. Nothing really happens. Um, Rome begins to uh, have its influence. And then uh, there was a general by the name of Pompey. And we know these things because of uh, historians of Philo, uh, Eusebius, and Josephus. And what we know happened is this general named Pompey, Roman general... And this is when Rome was actually switching from a republic into kind of the emperor-based Rome. Pompey was kind of one of the first great leaders there. And he says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go in. I think we need to take Jerusalem. So Pompey takes his army, and he comes into Jerusalem. Now, you have to understand, the Israelites 
from the end of the Old Testament to now have still been, you know, uh, dispersed. Uh, they're not doing great, but they still have a, a hold on Jerusalem. And there are, you know, there are a number of, of Israelites, of Jewish people that live there. And what do they have? They have the temple, right? It's Zion. We at least have the temple. And here's what we do know, that God resides in the temple. So you know what Pompey does? Pompey says, you know what? These people are too high on their horse. I, I'm going to go in. Uh, I'm going to walk up the temple mount. And this is 63 AD or BC. I'm going to walk into the holy place. So Pompey, the general, walks into the holy place. But here's what we know. The Old Testament told us, but at least he would never be able to go into the Holy of Holies because if you walk in there, that's Yom Kippur. The one day out of the year, the high priest can go into the Holy of Holies. Only if he does everything right will he not be killed. So a Jewish, uh, you know, a, a Hebrew would think, if Pompey walks into the holy, the holy of Holies, he's dead. I mean, God will just kill him. And what does Pompey do? You know, this is kind of this expectation. He walks into the holy place and then there's the curtain and he walks in to the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant is. And he disgraces it. Right? He disgraces it. He doesn't completely destroy it, but he disgraces it. And then what does he do? He walks out. And imagine if you're there and you're one of the priests who have to go light the fragrance at the altar of incense in the holy place. Every day it had to be, it had to be uh, burned or lit. And uh, you're thinking, wait, Pompey just walked into the Holy of Holies and he wasn't killed? You know, maybe I'm starting to lose hope, right? You know, there's certain, there's certain things um, that uh, I hold on to. And you know what? If, if Pompey didn't die in the Holy of Holies, you know what I wonder? I wonder if God's left me. Have you ever wondered that? Has God abandoned you? Has God left is he gone? Because in 60 BC, um, imagine you're a priest going in there thinking, is, you know, is he not even holy anymore? Does that mean he, his presence isn't there? There's no more power? Did he leave the temple? I thought that's where he resided. I thought you know, the whole world was going to be blessed through Israel. What is going on? And um, I think a lot of us maybe are feeling that or have felt that in ways where you think, you know what, I think... Um, God, God is gone. Uh, hope has, has left my life. I, I do not. I do not have it. Because many times, you know, the, the biggest rival to hope, uh, this kind of anticipation of the future is this, is when you have a sudden terrible event happen in your life. Right? Because when those things begin to happen, when a, when a ruler comes in and surprise attacks you, when you get a diagnosis you had no idea was coming, when you realize that your spouse just filed for divorce on you, when you just, you know, you realized all of this was going on behind your back, we have these surprise negative events. And you know, if those things begin to pile up, what do you become? What do I become? I become skeptical. I become caustic and, and, and sarcastic. There's no hope. I mean, the future, no, don't, God, what? Maybe you've gone, and should I even really believe in, in a good future? Imagine you're the Hebrews. You know, 450 B.C., last of the prophets. Now you've got Pompey doing what he's doing. And then, what do we do? We come to uh, the beginning of the Gospels, and we're going to look at Luke chapter 1. Because what we have right here is we have a story that sets the table for Christmas. It's kind of this precursor to Jesus. Uh, this is going to be Luke chapter 1, verse 5. When Herod was king of Judea, there was a Jewish priest named Zechariah. He was a member of the priestly order of Abijah, and his wife, Elizabeth, was also from the priestly line of Aaron. So what do we know about Elizabeth and Zechariah? They're priest kids, right? They're church kids. They're pastor's kids, right? I mean, they, they, know, they know the church thing. Um, they're, they're around, um, you know, around the temple. They're in the line of these priests. Um, and it says, you know, not a lot of them, but verse 6 says, Zech Zechariah and Elizabeth were righteous in God's eyes, careful to obey all of the Lord's commandments and regulations. What does that tell us? Zechariah and Elizabeth. You know, they had some hope. Why in the world would you um, obey 
uh, the commandments and the regulations and, and to honor God with your time and your treasure and your talents. Why would you do that unless you had hope? That the story of the Hebrews, the story of God through Israel was the true story. They had hope. Though many of the Jews had left Jew- Jerusalem, there, um, many of them had gone to different areas and they're just going to kind of isolate and, and not be hopeful. Here, kind of we have like, like the sun's about to rise a little bit. Like, no, it's been dark. The intertestamental time is dark. And all of a sudden you, see, you begin to see a little hope here. They were righteous in God's eyes. And then Luke, who wrote this gospel, remember he's a doctor, so he includes details. Very, uh, he's very intentional about everything he writes. And then he includes this. They had no children <coughs> because Elizabeth was unable to conceive and they were both very old. What, what would happen um, if you were a woman in the first century here uh, or a little before, and you were unable to be unable to conceive. You were probably mocked. People probably thought you had a curse. Uh, there was a curse on you. Why? Because you couldn't have kids. That's one of the you know major roles. Is hey, look, you can't procreate, and and so you're cursed. And when you're cursed, it's normally because you've done something wrong. Karma, right? If you believe like the gods have cursed you. Because you haven't been obedient. That's the reason you can't get pregnant, right? It's something that, that you did. But verse 6 says, they were, she was barren, but you know what? They were righteous. In other words, they weren't perfect, but they sure pleased God. They were hopeful Hebrews living through a hard situation. Probably praying all the time, God, we want to have kids. For those of you that have gone through that, I have, we have not, but we um, walked through that with a number of families. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very uh, arduous journey to walk through that, watching people do it and uh, placing blame all over the place. And it's, it's, just, it's just a rough spot. But they were righteous in God's sight. So they were, they were uh, hopeful, right? Then it goes on. It says this. One day, Zechariah was serving God in the temple for his order <clears throat> was on duty that week. As was the custom of the priest, he was chosen by lot. So there's 24 divisions of priests, right? During this time, there are 24 divisions. So basically, uh, Zechariah's order had two weeks out of the year, approximately. To what? Go in and light the altar of incense. That's what he would do it for two weeks. And as was the custom of his division, he was chosen by lot which basically means you were given a number on, on a, you know, some dice and said if, if number two comes up, you're going in, right? So in other words, we're not doing any manipulation. We're just letting the, the dice roll. He was chosen by lots because, you know, we, we want God to decide all things, to enter the, the sanctuary of the Lord and burn incense. While the incense was being burned, a great crowd stood outside praying. Now, I think this is um, important to, to note. If it was 63 B.C. and it says that Zechariah and Elizabeth were old, what do we know? Maybe when they were, what, two to five? That's old they were when Pompey walked into the Holy of Holies, probably with one of their fathers who was a, a, you know, a priest on rotation. So their fathers, or maybe even themselves as a young kid, would have either experienced or at least heard in vivid detail when Pompey walked in from Rome and basically desecrated the Holy of Holies. And imagine you're that, right? I mean, if God isn't in there, if he wasn't struck down, and here's Zechariah in the holy place. While Zechariah was in the sanctuary, an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing to the right of the incense altar. Zechariah was shaken and overwhelmed with fear when he saw him. You know, you hear people say, man, I just wish I had an angel around me all the time, just kind of helping me. Every time an angel comes, I don't think I want an angel around because he was shaken and overwhelmed with fear. I think I would be a mess and need to get a new set of clothes on after seeing an angel. Um, But he was shaken and overwhelmed. But as an angel always does, right? Do not be afraid, Zechariah. God has heard your prayer. Some of you question whether or not God hears you at all. 
And maybe you came for this one sentence this morning. You need to know this. In your, um, in your prayers, in your frequent prayers, in your persistent prayers, here's what the truth is. God hears them. God hears your prayers. And he knows your heart. And the angel says, don't be afraid. What you've been hoping for, your wife Elizabeth will give you a son. And you are to name him John. And more than that, Zechariah, you will have great joy and gladness. And many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the eyes of the Lord. He must never touch wine or other alcoholic drinks. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before his birth. And he will turn many Israelites to the Lord their God. Those that have lost hope, the, 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 the person in your belly is going to return hope. They left hope a long way, you know, way back there. And he's going to go get it and say, hey, you dropped this. I'm going to return hope to you. He will be a man with the spirit and the power of Elijah. He will prepare the people for the coming of the Lord. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children, and he will cause those who are rebellious to accept the wisdom of the godly. God hears your prayers. Here, are, here is a couple that was hoping for this, but they hoped in God. And it was a great place because when he's doing his priestly work, it doesn't say he was down. He was, you know, they wanted to have a kid, but they were living life wanting that, not having that, but living uh, peacefully, living with the joy of the Lord. They were hopeful Christians. And here's God saying, you know that thing you hoped for because you've hoped in me and you've been hoping for this and God doesn't always do this, we know that. But you know that thing you've been hoping for? I'm going to give it to you. In fact, I'm going I'm to surpass your expectation. Your kid is going to be, I mean, they're going to build cathedrals. I mean, that you can still go to uh, in 2018 and go see John the Baptist, you know, cathedral to John, uh, John the Baptist. That's how much um, he loves you. And so all of a sudden you have a terrified and then I'm sure delighted uh, Zechariah <laughs> but then what's his response and this is, is is this not you and me when God says I'm going to bless you it's coming right? it's, it's beginning to come that thing you've been hoping for what does Zechariah say Zechariah said to the angel how can I be sure <laughs> this will happen right I'm an old man now and my wife is also well along in years what is he saying here He's saying, in that moment, you know what he did? He began to kind of like pick a little fight. <laughs> hey, uh, angel person, um, look, I want to be sure about this, right? Because I don't want to be dropped. What is he doing? He's saying, kind of implicit in this, what's happening inside of him. What he's hoping for now is beginning to what? Grow and grow instead of the hoping in. And so when God begins to bless us, what happened every single time Israel was blessed? They forgot who they were hoping in. How many times has God given you a blessing? And then he gives you a promotion. And now you're making this amount. And then that, what, that was a privilege, a blessing. But a year later, that's not a blessing anymore. That's not a privilege. That's a right. It's turned into something that I deserve. Where a year ago we were hoping for this. Now it's something that we, what, that we demand and we don't hope for that. Because now we're hoping for you know, the next thing and the hoping for begins to what? Begins to grow and rival what? Rival the hoping in. And then the angel, the messenger from God says, I am Gabriel. Like, you know, Gabriel, Gabriel, the angel that came to Daniel, that told Daniel what was going to happen in the future way back when, right? Way back in the 600 BCs. I'm Gabriel. I'm that person. I was there 600 years ago with Daniel, and now I'm here again. Obviously, it's, it, was, it, it was, I stand in the very presence of God. It was he who sent me to bring you this good news. When God has you in a good place, and that's the scary thing, I think, for, we don't realize from God's perspective. If I give you what I want, are you still going to be in that spot? You want money, or you want health, 
or you want blessing and I give it to you, are you going to still be in that soft, humble place? Because all of a sudden, Zechariah's tone and he wants to be sure about things. And he doesn't want to have to, you know, live uh, by faith. And so God, um, many times, I, I think, holds things back from us. Because what can happen is hope for earthly provision and security shouldn't what? Shouldn't rival your hope in God. But, but how many times does it happen? How many times do I want something? Um, I want something right now. Because my hope shouldn't be in earthly provision. I love this quote from John Rockefeller Sr., who over his lifetime gave away $750 million, right? When he was being interviewed, talking about his hope, he says, yes, yes, I tithe. And I would like to tell you how it all came about. I had to, to begin work as a small boy to help support my mother. My first wages amounted to $1.50 per week. The first week after I went to work, I took the $1.50 home to my mother. And she held the money in her lap and explained to me that she would be happy if I understood where this came from. And I would give, it, I would give a tenth of it to the Lord. I did. And from that week, week until this day, I have tithed every dollar God, God has entrusted to me. And I want to say, if I had not tithed the first dollar I made, I would not have tithed the first million dollars I made. Tell your readers, he says to them, to place their hope in the Lord and not in the dollar. To train the children to tithe and they will grow up to be faithful stewards of the Lord. You hope for earthly provision, right? We hope for security. But that cannot what rival what you hope in. How, how does your hope for, what are you hoping for right now? And if you were to weigh that on a scale, how does that compare to your hope in God? Like, um, this is where I'm finding myself. So what does God do? Okay, look, you missed it. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to discipline you. But now... Since you didn't believe what I said, you will be silent and unable to speak until the child is born. I mean, can you imagine that? He's been waiting his entire life, and all these people are waiting for him to come out of the holy place, and he comes out, and he's like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, right? You get it. No, they can't even hear you. You placed your hope in that moment in the thing, what? In the thing um, that you hoped for instead of hope in God. And I want to make sure that the first words, what? The first words that you say once John the Baptist comes out, right? Is understanding where this came from. It came from me and your hope in me. I can give you things when you hope in me. Seek first the kingdom of God, Jesus says, um, and then all these things shall be added unto you. But I have to be the thing that you hope in. Because if you're not hoping in me, how, how can I give you a promotion? How can I give you more influence? How can I give you um, kind of, you know, the, the responsibility over these things if I am not your rock? And I think some of us, we want things, right? Uh, we, we want things right now. And I think the last, the last verse of, or the last sentence of this verse is so, um, so important. For my words will certainly be fulfilled at the proper time. At the proper time. What, what is he saying? What is he saying? What is Gabriel saying right, you know, right here to Zechariah? You know, Zechariah, God had this on his calendar. And it was God's calendar. And this was the day he was going to give you this news. And it's his time. Paul says in Galatians 4, when the time was fully pregnant, when the time had fully come, what? Jesus came. When the time was right. And so some of you right now, are you are hoping, you are hoping, and here's what you think. God is just so silent. And if God is silent, then I have to make this jump. But what Gabriel is trying to tell you and try to tell me, that when God is silent, he is not absent. No, no, no. It's not time. I'm right here, but it's not, no, no, no. You, no, you trust in my word. 
um, and I'm going to stay silent in this season. You just trust in my calendar, on my plan. What is it right now that you feel like God has been silent about in your life, and then you assume then he's absent? And you live that way, and I live that way. Not only is he absent, I think when God is silent, he is not, um, I think he's not active. And that's the exact opposite of what this is saying. When God is silent, there's no way he's inactive. You know how many things were being put into place? Um, And and how God probably, I mean, has used so many different um, uh, circumstances in your life. And you don't think he's working at all, but but you know he brought you to this place. And that, that relationship didn't work out so you could be with this person. And you thought God wasn't active at all because he was so silent. And you thought you got fired from the job because of this. And he was silent, but you know you're here now. I thought when this happened to my kid or whatever, or when this happened to, that meant he was just a passive God, right? He was a sluggish God. He's not doing anything. But here's what we do know, that while, what? While we are waiting, God is working. Because how many times have I seen somebody wait and not get what they want? And you know what I do when people tell me um, that they are waiting? I, I just kind of do it, I think, just intuitively. I watch them. I want to know what people are doing while they're waiting. And you know the people that uh, are faithful and they're like the Zechariah and the Elizabeth, and they go to the temple and they do their job while they're waiting. You know how encouraging that is to me? So many times I don't tell these people. But what I realize is God is using their waiting um, to work in my heart. Because you don't know how many people are looking at you. You don't know the lives that as you're waiting on something and you're sharing, this is what I'm waiting on. This is what I long for. You know, Uh, my, my, my wife and her heart, my husband and his heart, my son's heart is hard, my, my daughter's heart is hard, and I just want them to change. And you're waiting and you're talking about this, but your hope is in God and His plan. And when you are faithful, and no one expects anyone to be perfect, but when you're faithful in that, you know how many saints in the church you encourage? Um, that God is using your waiting, your temporary season, to give hope to others. And then... I think also, um, how many times in the waiting, God says, maybe I'm not working through you, but maybe I'm working on you. And in this time where you haven't received that promotion, maybe there's a fruit of the Spirit in your life, like maybe impatience. Or we gotta, before I'm gonna give you this, before you're gonna get what you hope for, there's this anger thing, right? Before, you know, I want you to be leading a family, you've got this, hey, this sadness that you bring with you everywhere and you don't show the joy of the Lord. And so you know what I want to want to bring, the fruit of the Spirit I need to bring out in you is joy. You, you need to be joyful. And for others, it's you're joyful, but you know what? You have no self-control. And I got to, you know, while you're waiting on this blessing, while you're waiting uh, for God, um, be in Him and watch the fruit of the Spirit self-control begin to work. And, and God would do that inside of you. But you know what? It's hard. Um, it's hard. I remember um, there's one particular uh, dinner where Lou was making, we, we have this crock pot. And crock pot makes unbelievably tasty meat, right? Like a, there's nothing like a pot roast, right? That's been in, the, been in the crock pot for five hours, right? And you're just ready to hammer some meat down, right? And I remember coming in, and I just wanted to s- just slam some food, like then. And... Uh, um, I noticed that the, the, you know, the timer said it had an hour left. I'm like, that might as well be next week, you know. It was just the way I was feeling in that moment. And then um, I reach into the freezer, and uh, or I, I open up the freezer, and I'm like, yep, mini Hot Pockets, right? Wait an hour, right? Wait an hour for this meat, or put about 35 mini Hot Pockets on a plate, and, you know, fire that thing up for three and a half minutes. So, you know, what did I do? <laughs> Put it on the plate, <laughs> three and a half minutes, scalding hot, right? Hot, po- mini hot pockets, whatever. 
put it, it tastes like, you know, kind of glorified cardboard and you're eating it, but you're so hungry, right? You want it now, right? And I, you know, I, you know, the, my tongue, I probably won't be able to eat for another week. I just have to have milkshakes because my, my mouth is burned. But, you know, and then I remember then, then there was the main course served and I was full of cardboard <laughs> and not meat, right? Not like what I could have had, this tasty pot roast. And I think that's what happens because if we feel like there is no hope, um, here's what happens. Waiting is unbearable. It is unbearable. If you don't have hope and you are waiting for something, the waiting is why we need hope. How many people are in this room right now and you feel the crushing weight of, um, or the crushing, uh, yeah, power of having to wait and you don't have a lot of hope? I'll tell you what, that's a scary place to be because we do some terrible things. We make horrible decisions when there isn't hope in our waiting. And so I ask you, when we understand that God has a plan, and it's his plan, we wait, but we have hope. And yes, things, things have a, a weight to them, and we feel the pressure of those things, but it will not, what? It will not destroy you. I mean, you may be oppressed, but you will not be struck down. That's what the gospel says. If you have hope, right, you, you can make it. And some of us, man, what are you hoping in? Because when hoping for overwhelms the hoping in, I tell you what, uh, we become different people. I love this story. June 25th, 1865, Hudson Taylor, the great missionary at 33, came to a great crisis. He was on, sitting on a beach in, in the, on the south coast of England. And on a Sunday morning, he decided to take a, a, a step of faith in response to a scriptural principle that he had just discovered. And he was surprised at 33 that this truth had eluded him. And it was this. If we are obeying the Lord, if we are relying on the Lord, and I'm a missionary, he was saying, then the responsibility rests with the Lord and not with me. And that transformed him. The responsibility is on God. To what? To redeem the world, not on you. If we live in Him, focus on Him, take the blessings and sometimes the, you know, the, 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 the no's that He gives us, all as a part of God's plan. You know what? We are free. And what did He do? He says, I'm going to China. <laughs> right? Hudson Taylor said, I'm going to China now. Right? I, I'm free and I'm going to go to China. And I'm going to just evangelize my heart out. Because if I am in him and I'm doing the right thing and my hope is in him, then all the responsibility rests with him. And it freed him up. And he went out and he formed China Inland Mission. And how many thousands upon thousands of Chinese did we see come to know the Lord through this free man who placed his hope in the Lord? Um, And so I believe God says, okay, you're hoping for, because you hope in what you're hoping for, I'm going to give you some. Here you go. Where are you this morning? Where is it? Do you believe that in your waiting right now, God is working? Do you believe in God's silence that he is present? Do you believe in his silence that he is what? That he is still active and he's moving and he's doing all the things that are necessary to bring about his plan? Because if you don't believe that, you know what? I'll tell you what, life becomes unbearable things become way too big and we're not living as God has called us to live so um, let's pray and let's ask God to place our hope in the plan of God and the redemption that we get through Jesus so that we may be able to wait well